Hi, Change How Conference. Uh, I'm Julian Adjaman. I'm uh, a Brit, as you can hear, but I'm living in Boston, Massachusetts, where we've got about four feet of snow. So uh, uh, I'm hoping I'm going to stay warm and uh, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to say something that's going to inspire you. Julian, can you tell us um, about you personally as well and your, your personal story that kind of the first things that set you on the path to making a difference? Well, as a kid, I was growing up in East Yorkshire and I was always into nature, I was always into the environment, but you know, unlike a lot of young people today, my journey into the environment wasn't through the threat of impending environmental apocalypse, mine was through the wonderment of nature. I was a bird watcher. I, I hate to say I used to collect birds' eggs, but this was a long time ago. So, um, and I used to uh, I used to go bird watching with friends. I had a great geography teacher who used to take us on field trips. We used to go and look at landforms, and it just fascinated me how things are as they are. And that was really the beginning for me of uh, a sort of passion for the environment. It changed from a, a passion about the science of the environment to more about the social science. I'm now interested in how we as humans um, can make positive change. And that's not a science question, that's a social science question. So, um, can you um, describe for me your kind of first steps along that path when it became not just about a hobby, about looking for birds or feeling a sense of wonder at nature, but became something that became a cause for you? Yeah, I think uh, when I was a kid, I mean, Obviously, you know, the late 60s and 70s, there were certain big events happening. I mean, we'd just seen uh, the satellite images of planet Earth from space. We'd seen the big blue marble. There was no planet B, you know, there was no plan B. There was no umbilical cord connecting us to something else. We were out there in space, and that really had a profound effect on me. The moon landings uh, in the late 60s had a profound effect. Uh, in the 70s then, you know, limits to growth and the, uh, the blueprint for a green planet. These were all momentous occasions in terms of my understanding that, you know, there is only this place and that we have got to share it more fairly and we've got to steward it much better and we've got to get on a lot better together. What was the first um, kind of major project that you undertook that to to realize that? Wow, the first major project I undertook, I think, was, was really going to university and, you know, studying geography and botany and uh, really, you know, geography and botany today would be called environmental science or, uh, or human ecology, something like that. And it was really realizing how interrelated uh, all of the, the systems are, whether they are human systems or ecological systems. And it was, it was, uh, you know, getting involved with uh, groups, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, organizations that were uh, at least talking about the possibility of change. At that time, I didn't realize, though, in the 70s, that there was such a divide still between the sort of, you know, the, the, the science-based environmental groups and the more social justice-based groups that I later became more interested in. You kind of identified quite early on um, a kind of a difference between the, the kind of trendy green groups and movements and the way that that and the science and the way that that kind of doesn't completely relate to the way that ordinary people live their lives and you you kind of wanted to make make that change and make that connection between your average person who cares and is part of an environment and and someone who is a green campaigner yeah, one of the big realizations I had um, was that wherever environmental degradation is happening in the world, it's usually in relation to uh, human rights issues, social injustice. So if we look at the Agoni people in the Niger Delta, if we look at uh, people in the Amazon, in the, uh, in the jungles in Cameroon, anywhere in the world, environmental degradation is linked to human rights issues. And so it really became obvious to me that we couldn't just tackle green issues in themselves. We have to look at the degradation of people and the, the, um, the depreciation.
depreciation of people's dignity who were forced to spoil their own environments to survive. You know, it's not poverty, I think, that is, uh, that is damaging the world. It's wealth, and it's the exploitation of poor people uh, in poorer parts of the world that we foster on those people. So, example, um, I saw oh, 20 years ago a, a, a book on the ivory trade from WWF. And the picture on the front cover was of four Africans covered in blood inside the carcass of an elephant. Now, what does that say to the young readers of that book? It says, these Africans are killing elephants. I would rather have seen a picture of wealthy Chinese people in Hong Kong buying ivory, which is the driver of these poor Africans' uh, dilemma. So, again, I just started to put two and two together. And all of this you know, came together really in the late 80s for me when uh, I set up an organization called the Black Environment Network in Britain. Now, we weren't dealing in issues like uh, ivory or, or, or that kind of stuff. We were looking at why weren't um, black Britons going to the British countryside? Why did I, as a, a black teacher in Carlisle, when I was going up in the Lake District, taking kids out, why were people staring at me? Um, and a whole group of us got together and thinking, what is it about the British countryside that seems to be a white space? Why is it that there's so few black Brits going into the British countryside? And so that was the origins of the Black Environment Network. And the organization still goes, still runs today. Um, I think it's changed its focus a little bit, but I would say that that was the first British-based environmental justice group. If you um, had five years to change one very important, very specific thing that you could give all your focus to and all your energy and, and change it in five years, what what would that thing be? What would you focus on? One thing that really interests me now as, uh, as a professor in urban planning is can we design public spaces for encounter? How do we get people in our increasingly diverse and different cities to mix? Um, Enrique Canalosa, the former mayor of Bogota, who's a big hero of mine, public intellectual, said, in parks, people meet as equals. His point was that we don't have our cars, we don't have pos uh, positional goods, status items around us, but we can meet as equal in these public spaces. So I think about this a lot as an urban planner, and I think, can we design culturally inclusive spaces, spaces in, of encounter where different people can talk? Because one of the things that worries to me about the way our cities are going is that we are disconnecting from each other. We're not connecting, we're disconnecting. And so what is the role of um, urban planning and the creation of spaces, meaningful spaces of encounter? What is the role of urban planning in that? And I don't mean just professional urban planners. I mean, how can we help communities uh, increase encounter? Because there is a theory that the more we interact with each other, the more we understand each other. And I'm a real dreamer of an intercultural society, a society where we are culturally competent, where we feel um, empathy with each other, where we respect human dignity. And that will only come about if we do increase the, the, the opportunities for encounter. So, not just different groups sitting around but how do we get those groups to talk in between groups? That's what I do. That's one thing I would really look at. And I think that would make a huge difference to the happiness and well-being in our cities. What do you think the role is for politics in all this? Is it a, is it a job for politicians to, to make this kind of change happen? Or is it always going to be a, a role for, for the grassroots, for academics, or, or something that just... That emerges naturally. Oh, I, you know, I like uh, thinking about uh, a different kind of politics. At the moment, in the US and in the UK, probably to a lesser extent, but certainly in the UK as well, we've got this old, tired political binary of right and left. I think there's a new politics, and I, you know, I borrow from the maybe unwisely, but borrowing from the German Greens, you know, we're not right, we're not left, we're just ahead. Um, I kind of like that. I, I want to see a new politics, uh, a politics of engagement, a politics that, um, in a sense, 
that, 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 that happened, it seemed to me, certainly watching from the US, uh, the politics of the debate in Scotland. So many people were engaged in that. It was, it was a, an excitement uh, and a passion about the issues. How do we, how do we bring that back into our, our politics? And that's something of a challenge. But I, I really would like to see, um, and maybe the millennial generation, maybe your generation, is, is up for the challenge of, of a new politics, uh, politics of, um, of inclusion, politics of interculturalism. And that's not to say that we are post-racial, but that's to say that, that we are pro-inclusion, that we want to understand the groups and each other. Are you um, optimistic that that's something that could happen? across the world? I, I, I'm optimistic, yeah. I'm optimistic that we can make changes. Um, I mean, we can't just sit down and have a kumbaya moment and, and, and everything will be, will be nice. So, I mean, there are many different um, features, many different things that we need to do to make uh, the platform for that kind of change to happen. But we can do them. And, you know, one thing that I really do want to emphasize is that we have the science of sustainability. We know what we need to do to be sustainable on this planet. And we absolutely have the technologies to do it. We've just got to want to do it. So that's not a science issue. That's social science. That's a psychology, anthropology, sociologist's kind of question. And one of my worries about sustainability is that the domination of the discourse by environmentalists is not where we need to be. Sustainability is a big tent. It's a broad church for a whole range of interests. And Domination by environmentalists, I think, is counterproductive because the media can, can pick us off and say, oh, they're just crazy environmentalists. You know, that, I'm one of them. I'm an environmentalist, but I'm also what I call an environmental social scientist. I know about how we motivate changes in human behavior. And so that's really where we need to go. We need to look at uh, the ways in which we're uh, not engaging certain sections of society and really make um, inclusion, the big, big uh, 